It appears I can. Excellent. All right, great. Well, I'll hand it over to you. Take it away, Dan. All right, great. Now we try the other button. Let's see if I can share. And silence is dangerous here. Yeah. No, you're good. Go ahead. Excellent. We're away. Cool. So thanks. Uh, yeah, my name is Daniel Faber. I'm the CEO of Orbit Fab. Uh, we are building gas stations in space. Um, I guess I should start with a little bit of background on myself. Um, I'm, as you can probably tell from this accent, I'm Australian. Um, I've lived in, in several places now, but uh, when I was doing undergraduate in, uh, in Australia, I decided I wanted to do something interesting with my career and, uh, and my life and something that would be important for humanity. And because I was doing an engineering degree and I'd learned to integrate, I decided that uh, the only things really worth working on were existential risks. And the best way to address a bunch of existential risks is to get some people off this planet. So I decided that it's, you know, there was no government space agency. There were no big companies that were working in aerospace in Australia. Uh, I figured if we wanted to, to really get a lot of people off this rock, it had to be a commercial basis. We had to find a profit motive because that's a good incentive to make things happen. Uh, and so I wrote down a list of industries that might pay enough to create the first permanent jobs in, uh, off Earth, the first permanent jobs in space. And that list was tourism and mining. And uh, I couldn't see myself as a tour operator, so that was it. There was only really one thing to do, and I've been working on uh, asteroid mining for the last 25 years. This, uh, this is a bit of a story about what's uh, the latest chapter uh, in that journey. But uh, I got an engineering degree. I was lucky enough to, to work with some absolutely brilliant people uh, on the core engineering team to build a dozen satellites or more uh, in several countries around the world because, again, Australia, not much happening. Um, but then I was always looking at, at how to set up these companies because nobody else was doing it. And, and so I started uh, building companies. Uh, first, instrumentation for the terrestrial mining industry. Um, the second then uh, was high-speed internet for Antarctica. I wanted a KA band transponder that we could use on deep space satellites to go and prospect asteroids. Um, that got commercialized in a couple of Californian companies. Uh, and then after that, and most recently before, before Orbit Fab, uh, at Deep Space Industries, where our big, hairy, audacious goal was asteroid mining. Um, and, and I came in, uh, got the, the co-founders to do the paperwork to get me to the US, and, and finally got to, to work on asteroid mining and tell the world what I was planning to do, and, uh, and realized that the one business model that the company had before I joined was to bag a billionaire, uh, and realized that wasn't going to work. So I brought in a strategy uh, around the technology where if we want to mine something from an asteroid, we'd, we'd already figured out you're not going to make a lot of money mining metals. Um, you're competing with all the, the terrestrial mines. There's a lot of metal in the, in the Earth's surface. Now, even rare earth elements, the, the first thing to know about rare earth elements is that they're not actually that rare. So we, we did the math. And while you could get several thousand dollars per ton of asteroid material in value in the platinum grade elements or the nickel, um, yeah, that's still still several thousand dollars a ton is much better than the, the you know sometimes it's as little as ten or twenty dollars a ton for terrestrial mines. Uh, so it's much higher, but even still, it's very hard to close the business case. But we also realized if you get propellant out of the asteroids or the moon, then you look at some of the wetter uh, asteroids, the carbonaceous chondrite asteroids. They can have ten or twenty percent water in them, which could be sold in Earth orbit for about a million dollars a uh, sorry for ten million dollars a ton if you turn it into to good propellant. So when you look at that, the contained mineral value of the water in the asteroid is about $1 million per ton of rock. That's much better than those several thousand dollars. So we were mining water and hydrocarbons from the asteroid. That was our, that was our goal. To do that, we had to have a market we could sell it to in Earth orbit where it's actually worth a lot. Uh, and nobody was using thrusters that could run off that propellant. So at Deep Space Industries, we tried to send a prospect mission to an asteroid and failed because there was no thruster that we could use. And worse, there was no thruster that we could then refill. So we built that thruster. We talked to people and they said, hey, if you build that, we need it. We need to move our small satellites around. So that's what we did. We built a thruster that could run on water, basically a superheated steam kettle. And then we built the thrusters that could run on, on hydrocarbons and, and water-derived oxidizers. Uh, and we started a production line of those or a, a, a research development line. So that was going fairly well um, and uh, ended up, uh, Deep Space Industries was acquired because of those thruster technologies by Bradford Space, uh, a European thruster manufacturer. So that, that went fairly well, but uh, I, I left that company um, 
you know, realizing that, that our customers were looking at those thrusters and had this, this challenge that we had a very cheap thruster, but it wasn't very fuel efficient. And so our customers had to, to launch a lot of expensive fuel, uh, expensive because it's heavy, uh, or they could buy an expensive thruster and launch not a lot of fuel. And we thought there had to be a better way to solve this, this trade-off and this conundrum by just delivering the fuel in orbit. And so that was the, the gem of the idea of orbit path. And when taken from the perspective of asteroid mining, this is step two, right? Step one was build the thrusters that could run off this material. Step two is build the market for the material in orbit. And so with David Hurst, we, we co-founded the, uh, the Space Commodities Exchange to look at it sort of a top-down view of how governments could incentivize this and how trading and financial markets could incentivize it. And then Orbit Fab, I founded with Jeremy Scheel, um, was the bottom up, right? How do we build the technology and just get on and build the things with the expectation that eventually they'll meet in the middle when we can finally start trading fuel. So that was the genesis of Orbit Fab. And we're doing it because we want to build a bustling economy in space that can support humans. And right now, the space economy is the opposite of bustling. You launch a satellite and you never touch it ever again. That is the paradigm we live in. You can't touch it because you haven't got enough robotics and because there isn't a fuel supply to re refuel it, you end up just throwing the spacecraft away when they're done with their life. So we look at other sort of assets that have a 15 year old life, your know, aircraft, similar kind of price to a satellite, 400,000 times, sorry, 40,000 times they'll, they'll refill a, an aircraft in its life. Cars, you, you refill it once a week over 15 years, that's 750 times you've refilled your car. Uh, even rockets now, wow, I've got to update this slide. SpaceX is up to 10, and I think Blue Origin for their suborbital vehicle is up to about 15 refills. So launch vehicles are now refuelable. <clears throat> the satellites, zip, zero. We just, we, we don't refuel them. And we're in this paradigm, we don't even think about refueling them. We think that, that that's just how it's always got to be. That's the, the quintessential nature of a paradigm. But if you think about it from the perspective of cars, which you're familiar with, that'd be like buying a car with 15 years worth of fuel. And most of the fuel you would use towing the fuel around, it's ridiculous. And we couldn't even drive from, you know, say, San Francisco to LA. You rely on there being fuel stops all the way. So we want to completely change this paradigm by providing fuel in orbit. But let's look at the consequences of not having fuel. Every year, these big geostationary satellites, these are the big money earners in the space industry. Every year, about 20 of them are discarded. More than half of them are still fully operational. They've got customers on the, uh, on the Earth using the communication services. They're generating revenue. They're generating up to $20 million a year revenue, uh, which, which is then you're know, producing downstream you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of economic activity that's hanging off of these. And they have to throw them away because they run out of fuel and there's no way to fill them up. And so they throw them away. You have to build a completely new spacecraft and replace it. It's terrible. So it's like half a billion dollars a year is, is just discarded of, of, of fully operational value. Uh, and then we launch insertion. I, was actually, I actually tried to buy this satellite here. This picture is, I believe this one is Express AM4. It, it cost about $300 million to build and launch. Uh, it should have brought in over the 15-year lifetime several billion dollars of revenue, but they, they accidentally put it in the, in the, wrong, law, uh, in the wrong orbit. The, the upper stage failed to ignite. And so it was stranded. It was in orbit. It just wasn't in a geostationary orbit. And while there was fuel on board, they could have used all of that fuel to get to geostationary orbit. But once they're there, they would have slowly drifted away. They didn't have enough fuel then to keep it on station over the right part of the Earth. And so that was effectively useless. It was a, a complete loss, uh, insurance payout. They ended up just ditching it. We tried to buy it, move it over Antarctica, but because of the orbital mechanics, they didn't give it permission in time. And again, we just couldn't get any fuel to it, so it was useless. So that, that was it. We ditched it. And that happens like every couple of years there's a, a big satellite. It happened to the Galileo uh, 5 and 6 satellites for the European GPS constellation. That was a $12 billion constellation that was delayed coming into service because a couple of satellites got put in the wrong orbit. It's huge consequences. And then it happened to Starliner. Well, Starliner had some software issues. But basically, they ran out of fuel. They couldn't reach the space station. If they had been able to refuel Starliner and get it to the space station, Boeing may not have its lunch being eaten by SpaceX right now. I and mean, how many billions of dollars have been added to space, SpaceX valuation that, that haven't accrued to Boeing because they haven't been able to, to get uh, Starliner up to ISS? So uh, all of those are, are sort of fuel problems. Fuel would be good and, and save a lot of money in this industry. A, a huge, really existential problem for the space industry is space debris. And I'm sure everyone on this call has been hearing about space debris. It is a serious issue. 
it is not viable to remove that debris. And when you look at the statistical analysis and you know, what the risk is, there are some big pieces of debris that are much bigger risk than, than other pieces of debris. And they would have a much uh, bigger consequence if there are ever any accidents. And it's a serious probability that we're going to have an accident that kicks off a, um, a cascading, you know, a Kessler syndrome cascade. We can't remove those big problematic bits of debris right now because it takes so much fuel to go and get the debris and drag it into orbit. It'd be like launching a tow truck and towing two or three cars out of the way off the highway and then having to throw away the tow truck and build a new one. At that capital expense, is you just keep paying it because you can't refuel it. That means that it's not viable. The business cases don't close for those tow trucks. But that tow trucks, that's a threshold technology. If we can have tow trucks in space, we can refuel and reuse satellites and completely change the economics, completely change the risk uh, profiles and the financing mechanisms and everything. So this is now happening. Northrop Grumman launched the Mission Extension Vehicle 1. They've now launched MEV-2, and that's been successful as well. And they docked these to two Intelsat satellites. So this is a photo taken by MEV-1 of Intelsat 902 just before they docked to it uh, above geostationary orbit. MEV-2 actually docked to the second one in geostationary orbit. It's an incredible feat. Didn't bring it out of service. It continued providing communication services for customers. These were the world's first satellite servicing missions, commercial satellite servicing missions, I should add, but they were both throwaway tow trucks. So they carry a huge amount of fuel to last lots of years in, in acting as a jetpack. They take over the thruster function with these satellites that have run out of fuel, but once they're out of fuel, the tow truck is out of fuel, they, they ditch them. They, throw them, they throw them away. So the capital utilization on these is, is terrible. But this is what's happening. Despite the fact that these are all single use tow truck uh, business models, there's still been an explosion in the number of companies. So we formed Orbit Fab in 2018. And since then, there's been a 500% increase in the number of companies working on tow trucks in space, working on satellite servicing. And this really reflects the paradigm shift and the change in the technology with autonomous, basically self-driving spacecraft, autonomous rendezvous and docking. And, uh, and everyone's realization that, that there's a huge benefit that can be made uh, if you can just repair, inspect, uh, refuel, service, tow other satellites around and do these things in space. So here's what OrbitFab does. We build tankers. This is how we solve the problem. We build tanks. We put them on any available launch vehicle so we can get the best rates around. And we put these tankers of, of fuel into space where we manage the, the logistics, the orbital mechanics. We make sure the right fuel is available at the right place. And the customer satellites come and get fuel. And then they're able to, to go off and continue making revenue. That's it. It's, it's that simple. Of course, when we looked at this, we said, oh, we'll, we'll just build a tanker then. We'll, we'll make this happen. And we ran into the, to, to a serious problem. There was no fueling port. So we started working on this satellite gas cap. Uh, and trying to trying to come up with something that people could use. So what you see here on the left is the robotic side of that gas cap, uh, and on the right is is the service valve or the passive side. It's really small. It's the same weight, the same size, the same cost as the fill drain ports, the valves they use at the moment to fill the satellites on the ground. But you switch this in, and you get the optionality of refueling the satellite in orbit. So now you've got a satellite that can be refueled. Very simple change. So that was the first thing was to to get that right. We talked a lot of companies designing some complex robotics to make sure that, that everything here would uh, would work together. And then the Air Force came along and said, hey, we want them to, or now Space Force, we want them to, to our standards. Like you've got to test them against our rigorous requirements. So we've been going through that process. So that's starting to get adopted. We've been shipping them to, I think we've got export licenses to Europe, Japan, UK. Uh, we're really starting to see traction on those. <clears throat> the second thing we realized was you we have a fueling port. You still need to be able to bring the spacecraft together. And if you rely on the existing architectures and these tow trucks, the tow trucks are basically made to work with satellites that are broken down or satellites that weren't cooperative. Like they're not made to be serviced or docked or all the legacy satellites. So they've got complex robotic arms and complex navigation guidance systems to be able to approach a satellites that, that weren't intended to be approached. What we said was we want to design a future architecture, a future ecosystem where everything is cooperative and there was no docking standard. We didn't know what camera resolutions or QR codes or LIDAR or radar or what we needed. So we had to just sort of come up with this from scratch and make sure that it matched with the fueling port because you can see that that four finger gripper can grab onto the fueling port so that there's a strong hold and we can transfer high pressure propellant. But that's only gonna work if you can get it aligned within close enough tolerances that that can grab together. And we didn't wanna have robotic arms because that's expensive. So we wanna just bump the two spacecraft together and have that that robotic gripper be able to, to grab on and, and transfer fuel. So we started making 
uh, docking system, rendezvous docking systems and realized that no one had produced a cooperative docking system. So we're now building the self-driving satellite kit, um, which you can put a, a passive side, an active side, and, and now everything is much easier to go. So we've been testing this on the float table you can see in the lab, and, uh, and that's going to be ready to fly uh, end of next year. So uh, all of that's coming together. And then finally, we could start building a tanker. Wow, I really need to update this. This is quite an old um, um, uh, a rendering of, uh, of our first tanker. But we built the first tanker now. You can see it's got two of the fueling ports. It's got a thruster on it. This is a, a free-flying tanker that will uh, be in a low Earth orbit. It'll have high test peroxide uh, in it, which is a, a very aggressive oxidizer and monopropellant. Uh, and so that's being launched actually in about six weeks from now is the uh, expected launch date. Uh, so that will allow us then, even this year, to announce commercial availability of propellant in orbit with our, our first fuel tanker. So that's a, a very big milestone that's coming up. <clears throat> so other things that we uh, we did in the first year that we were operating was, like, okay, we've got to build and, and test a bunch of our systems. So we built an inflatable tank because we thought that was a part of the, the future ecosystem. We built this rigid uh, tank. When we launched them up to the, to the International Space Station, we were able to test the pumps, the plumbing, the feed systems, inside the space station pumping what was water, because water is, is safe for astronauts. And as you know, my last company, we built a water-based thruster, so it's a real propellant. But we transferred the water between these two tankers and able to prove all that worked. We actually then hooked up this tank to the International Space Station. We pumped the water across to the space station and became the first private company to resupply the space station with water. So that was, uh, that was in our first year of operating. Um, and, and really sort of got the team together and, and got us focused on what we were doing. We learned a huge amount about how we were going to approach refueling of uh, a spacecraft. And then, um, oh, here's a, is this a video? No, unfortunately it's not. This just uh, shows the inflatable tank and, uh, and how that was uh, working on orbit. We did a lot of sort of slosh dynamics with the flexible tank to check that out. Um, yeah, a bunch of things. Christina Kirk gave us uh, some really good help with that. Uh, and then here it is. It's hooked up to... Uh, through these tubes to the, the International Space Station water bus. They're really paranoid about us um, overpressurizing the bus and you don't want to, to blow up their water system. That that might result in them having to abandon the station. So uh, so they threw the book at us on safety. It turns out actually, if you, uh, if you let a, a gallon of water loose on the station and it gets onto an astronaut's face, they can't brush it away because surface tension is the biggest force. And so like you can actually drown in a gallon of water if it sort of gets around your face. So NASA classified this as a catastrophic level hazard. It's like the highest level of um, sort of safety requirements for any payload. So we had to jump through all of the hoops to build this. And they said, oh, it'll, it'll take you 24 months, you know, 18 to 24 months to build this and get it certified. And we knew there was a launch coming up. We said, no, no, we're going to do this in four and a half months and you're going to let us make it work. And so we, we did it. We, we had to preempt all the NASA meetings. We had to... Um, you know, just, just make things and, and show them why it was safe. But we had to find out the right people and hunt down like what the interfaces were even to hook it up to the International Space Station. In the end, we got our final requirements about two weeks before we handed over the hardware for, uh, for NASA and, and finished off the flight qualification testing we, because, because we were just getting ahead of where NASA was at. So it was an incredible program to just, just get that done. So with that done then, you know, we, we closed our seed round, we raised the money to build the first operational tanker uh, and that's this, this one here, again, needs an update because now we have real hardware. Uh, and so this was built in about six months, uh, maybe a bit less than six months from, uh, again, a napkin sketch to flight hardware ready to go. Uh, so we're on a pretty quick development schedule. The next big thing we're doing is an end-to-end -end refueling uh, trial, a fuel sale trial, where we'll have a customer spacecraft and a tanker come together. We'll transfer fuel between the two. We'll actually do dozens of dockings and undockings to prove that that is as reliable as, as landing a rocket on its tail, right? It's got to become boring. Uh, and so we've got to prove that, that that can happen in different lighting conditions and angles and everything else. So we'll do all of that with our demonstration mission uh, plan for the end of 22. Uh, we'll also be building inventory, putting more tankers into orbit. So we've got the right propellant available in the right orbit. And then our customers can have confidence that they're going to get the fuel delivered and they can start designing it into their business plans. So that's it. I, uh, there's a, a few pretty pictures here, but, uh, but really that's uh, a background of orbit rather than where we're at. And that leaves us lots of time for questions. Yeah, that's great, Dan. Thanks. Um, if you have questions, you can put them in the Q&A um, and uh, I'll, I'll transmit them over to Dan. Um, in, in the meanwhile, um, maybe can you 
tell us a little bit about uh, how, how you see the economics of this working in the future. Yeah, really interesting. And when we were looking at starting this up, actually, that the year after I came out of Deep Space Industries, we looked at a bunch of business models from uh, from the commodities exchange to making semiconductors in space because you can make um, semiconductor ingots with three orders of magnitude lower defect densities, um, which is super interesting. But turns out nobody wants to pay for a semiconductor substrate. Um, I looked at uh, at a couple of different things. That the the thing that um, that really solidified why we should be working on this, why orbit fab and the fuel supply was that customers were saying that for every kilogram of fuel they could get, they would see a million dollars of marginal revenue. Because their business model is driven by that capital asset, right? the expense of their spacecraft. And if you run out of fuel, you're throwing it away. And so any marginal fuel, all of that revenue would accrue. And it was more than a million dollars per kilogram. And that was one of the conversations, but other subsequent conversations sort of backed that up, hundreds of thousands of dollars a kilogram, that kind of thing. And so, you know, we, we know that we can cut good deals with launch companies. We might be able, even able to get a get to, to orbit for $1,000 a kilogram. That means we've got four orders of magnitude, sorry, three orders of magnitude, potential arbitrage, um, which tells me there's a business in the middle. Uh, of course, there's a lot to be built and, and a lot of people to convince of this paradigm shift, a lot of things that have to happen. So it's, uh, and what I talked about was marginal revenue, not marginal profit or value creation. Uh, and so, yeah, the, the reality, of course, is that it's still tricky to make a startup company. But it's uh, it's it's in there, in, in that um, that potential arbitrage is is where we're able to eke out a business and uh, and get venture capital financing and and start building everything. So you know, our costs um, are for our tanker, for the launch, those types of things, uh, and then our revenue from our customers' perspective is looking really at that the marginal revenue at end of life. That's, uh, that's how they look at it. There's a lot of second and third order effects. And once the infrastructure is built, we'll see a lot more things getting done with propellant, a lot of different ways to run missions. But right now, that, that's just how we see it, is, is end of life, life extension, what you can do with more fuel. Um, so a related issue to that, you showed um, a, a slide that in, indicated the, the tanker was going to some kind of structure and, you know, you're sort of building up a, a little reserve there. Um, but if you're talking about low Earth orbit, um, there's a lot of different orbits. So how do you how do you see positioning those uh, where satellites can have access to them? Yeah, really good question. The um there are a few orbits that are most interesting to customers. Of course, geostationary orbit is, is geostationary orbit, so, so that's one area. But in low Earth orbit, uh, there tends to be a clustering around 98 degrees, which is the sun synchronous orbit, um, which, which pr processes a degree a day. So it's always pointing the same direction relative to the sun. Uh, and so that's a, a very interesting orbit to a lot of customers that are looking down at the Earth because they can get uh, they can see the whole Earth from a near polar orbit and get almost con continuous um, or repeating ground tracks. So, so that's one inclination is 98 degrees. Uh, another inclination is 90. Another is 70 degrees. There tend to be uh, communications constellations uh, around those orbits. And then also 56 degrees with the International Space Station is. We see more and more activity in that inclination. So we've got four inclinations then in low Earth orbit where we'll, we'll start to build tankers. Um, the good thing is that's where most of the launches go. So even if we're just launching fuel as, uh, um, you know, as, as, as extra capacity, sort of ride share type things, we can get to the orbits because the launches go where the customers are and the customers are where the launches go. So everything lines up pretty well. Great. Um, I have a question here. Um, it seems like the current focus is on the near Earth orbit industry and satellites. How do you see that evolving over time with things like more orbital habitats and lunar development? Yeah, great question. I, my vision for, for a bustling space economy that can support humans and, and the first permanent jobs in space, I see a, a huge paradigm shift happen, uh, a, a huge sort of knee in the curve of activity when we get that first permanent job in space. And so I'm always looking to that and trying to figure out you know, where that might come and how we can accelerate that. Um, so you know, I love what Axiom is doing. Uh, building that the first commercial stations. I, I love NanoRacks now, uh, part of Voyager Space Holdings uh, family. Uh, they're looking to do similar kinds of things. Uh, I, I especially love the fact that there are two of them competing, because that's <laughs> that's a proven way is uh, two commercial companies competing results in in fast progress. Uh, so that's been really good. But then there's there's people looking at on-orbit manufacturing, um, you know, Varda Space, uh, Space Forge, uh, Lunar Industries. I think that there's a, there's a few of them, uh, and so. Um, we, we talk to all of those folks about you know, what they're going to need in terms of the material supply chain, 
uh, in terms of not just propellant, but you know, do you need air, do you need water, 3D printer feedstock, uh, lubricants, all those kind of things. And what I would like to be doing eventually is bringing material down the gravity well from asteroids in the moon and tall refining that material and putting it into a full on petrochemicals processing supply chain to make the, the products that people want to buy uh, in Earth orbit to be able to, to grow that economy and, and grow everything that's happening. So that's what we want to build is a, a petrochemicals company in orbit, far more than just a, a propellant supply chain. So uh, you mentioned bringing the, the resources down the gravity well. Um, and clearly that requires some kind of resource extraction from the moon or asteroids and so forth. Um, how, how do we get there? Since right now all the resources have to be boosted from the ground. So this is, this is what I've spent 25 years trying to, to figure out. Um, and uh, and the, first, uh, the first thing I realized, you know, as I mentioned, at Deep Space Industries, we realized that, that um, before we even started that, that, that selling metals on the ground is, uh, is not where the business is. It's going to be selling things in space, selling uh, you know, specifically propellant to get started. And so the first gap was we needed a thruster. That was step one. The thrusters now exist. And Deep Space Industries uh, has been acquired by Bradford Space, but there are several other companies building thrusters that run on water. Uh, or thrusters that run on uh, on hydrogen peroxide and hydrocarbons. Those are kinds of things that we can build from uh, that, that we can make from asteroid material. So that was step one. Step two, the propellant supply chain. Right, we're going to build a market so that then the asteroid miners have something to have someone to sell to. And and, and so that's it. I, I'd like to place the first purchase order with an asteroid mining company to buy the propellant they're mining. Um, between here and asteroid mining, there are three or four other big companies that need to be made. And the trick is to, to break that down into steps and then find the applications for each of those steps that allow us to build a big company when the whole ecosystem doesn't exist and when there's no material coming from asteroids. And so, uh, yeah, I've got some other parts of that uh, mapped out. Some of them might be follow-on businesses or extensions of what Orbit Fab does. But needless to say, that uh, there's still several more large companies to be made before we get there. Uh, we will get there you know, once uh, the investment is made and, uh, and people are ready to do trial mining. It's going to take uh, three, four, maybe five years to get to uh, the execution and return of that material uh, from an asteroid to, to start asteroid mining. But that could happen. You know, people may have invested that money today and, uh, and not told us. Um, so it may be sooner than we think, or it may be 10 or 15 years away, because there's still a lot of risk in it. And, uh, and typically that risk has to be reduced by, by technology development, by proving out the market, by solving the regulatory problems and all those kinds of things. So, uh, you know, the, the timing is still up in the air, but I'm pretty optimistic it's going to happen sometime in my life. Um, I, I was trying to get actually at the economic uh, side of this, which is that uh, boosting things up the gravity well is tremendously expensive, but it, it's going to take that first and before we can get to somewhere to bring it down the gravity well, right? So that yep. was sort of the gap that I'm I'm uh, wondering about. Yeah, you're absolutely right, and, uh, and <laughs> I appreciate David. You, you always asking these questions about the economics because they're some of the most important questions we can ask. <laughs> the um, and the answer is we have to close our business with everything coming off the ground, right? We have to, and everyone has to do that up until the point when somebody finally mines things from an asteroid. And then the asteroid mining company have basically had to build their entire business off of things coming off the ground before there's finally that material. So that's the trick to it, is finding the markets and finding the ways to bootstrap it, reducing the amount of capital requirement, reducing the risk, while building the whole thing from ground supplied infrastructure, materials, technology. Uh, and then only once we've finally built out this whole chain link uh, industry, can we start dismantling parts of it when we no longer need them because we've got materials coming from asteroids? Uh, but it'll take a while. You've got to bootstrap it. That's hard. Yes, it is. I have another question here. Um, how much of a threat to the business model are companies that are producing things like lightweight ion engines that extend satellite lifespan? Oh, I, uh, I love ion engines, but they still need ions. Um, they still want xenon. Uh, and if you've seen what's happened to the price of xenon, the predictions, uh, that's, uh, that's going to be expensive. So now companies like SpaceX are switching to Krypton. Um, you still need Krypton. Uh, we'll launch that from the ground and sell it to you. Eventually, all of that, to those noble gases are, uh, and the ion drives, um, that's going to be undercut by low-cost propellant coming from asteroids one day. Um, so I, I think we'll see a, a reversion, either a reversion to chemical propulsion or new ion propulsion thrusters that can run off asteroid-derived propellants. Um, so, you know, still optimistic. I, the, the, 
the great thing if uh, if somebody launches uh, a thruster that runs off xenon or krypton they're prepared to pay much more for that fuel per kilogram because they get more bang for the buck and so we charge higher prices for that because they buy it in, in smaller amounts the economics still work out fairly well for us one one way or another those propulsion systems need propellant and you're prepared to deliver it you got it excellent I have another question here. Do most satellites orbit in the same direction? If not, how does that complicate offering fuel depots? So the Earth spins in a, let's call it a clockwise direction. Um, depends whether you look at it from the South Pole or the North Pole, I guess. Um, to, the, the Earth spins towards the east. Um, and so if you launch towards the east, you get to add the Earth's spinning speed to the speed of your rocket when it launches, which saves you a bunch of fuel. So as a result, most um, launches happen towards the east. The thing is, there's some interesting orbital mechanics, and I mentioned the inclination of 98 degrees. If you go 98 degrees, effectively you're going backwards. It's actually a slightly retrograde orbit. And you do that because you get some really cool effects on the orbital mechanics at exactly that inclination. Um, and so they launch a little back than, from north and actually try and cancel out the spin of the Earth. So the closer to the pole you can launch, actually, the, the better for that one. Um, so, uh, yeah, there are some things that go retrograde, but almost everything goes, goes prograde. Uh, at the end of the day, we match the inclinations, and, uh, and we do a whole bunch of modeling on the orbital transfers. So, you know, if we have a, a tanker in place A and somebody wants fuel in place B, how much fuel do we have to burn to move from A to B? And if we're given enough notice of it, can we use some... Uh, low propellant, lower thrust tra trajectories, you know, manifold, fuzzy boundary um, you know, stuff where the sun and the moon will pull the inclination around and various things. So there's a bunch of tricks we can play with the orbital mechanics if we're given enough time. Uh, but if you want a rush order and, uh, and you want propellant immediately, you'll have to pay more because we're going to have to burn more fuel to get to you. So that's all part of the economics. It's a, it's a pretty difficult economic meets orbital mechanics modeling challenge that uh, we've had to wrap our heads around. There we go. And uh, one of the issues is that in order to push propellant around, you need to use up propellant. Um, and yeah, I, hate, I hate using up our own product. To yeah, exactly. Product at some point you have to. Um, are, are there cases where that doesn't close? It, it takes more propellant to deliver the propellant than what you can deliver. Oh, absolutely. Um, and it depends where the tanker is, right? But then we start thinking, well, if there's actually demand there, should we find a way to put a tanker into that orbit? And maybe we need to have a tug that runs on high efficiency propellant to move lower efficiency propellant into the different orbits. And we start looking at sort of higher levels of complexity in the logistics and supply chain. Um, we haven't gone very deeply into that complexity because complexity is the enemy of startup companies. Um, but we are aware that, that it's waiting for us. Excellent. I have another question here. Are you planning to charge customers a fixed rate per propellant mass supplied or lump sum mission cost or develop a life extension value share algorithm or some different revenue model? We've looked at a few different uh, ways that we can do that. The main thing we do is ask our customers, how would you, how would you like it? <laughs> um, and, and, you know, what's, what's worth more to you, right? So we've got to close our business and they've got to close their business. Um, but by restructuring things, you know, we can carry more risk or they can carry more risk. Uh, and, and so depending on who has better control of the risk um, in, and who, for whom the risk has less costs to mitigate, um, that's where the risks should lie, right? And so that's a, that's a bit of a negotiation. So we're somewhat flexible in that. We have you know, things that we think are, are fairly standard. <clears throat> because we see this as a lot of, of risk management, uh, we actually went out proactively and, and, and struck up conversations with the world's largest uh, satellite and rocket insurance company. And, uh, and they decided to invest in OrbitFab. So Munich Re, through their, their uh, investment for Munich Re Ventures, uh, are actually on, on OrbitFab's cap table. And, uh, and they're helping us with, with new insurance and financing products. Very cool. Um, here's another one. Do you hope to mine asteroids again after getting the fuel economy set up? Well, as I said, the fuel economy is step two. Um, we have the thrusters now that can use the fuels. We have the market for the fuels. Um, but there's three or four more companies that need to get built, I think, to build out the full supply chain. And so uh, 
the question really for me is just do we do that inside orbit fab or does orbit fab end up getting acquired and like we jump onto the next company um and that's an open question now that's going to depend on what those acquisition offers look like what the company matures to be whether we or ipo and use those financing mechanisms of public markets uh, i don't want to preempt how well or what orbit fab is going to look like in five years time but uh, but i can tell you what yeah i fully intend to keep going on this path and uh and work to crack the next nut in terms of, uh, of asteroid mining, even if that is only putting the purchase orders and buying the fuel. Uh, asteroid mining or lunar mining? Well, <laughs> there's a religious debate. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so I can give you my perspective, right? I, I'm, I'm an asteroid guy. The, um, we know more about the geology of the asteroids because we have a couple of hundred thousand grab samples uh, from asteroids that have just fallen from the sky. Uh, they're called meteorites. We pick them up, you look at the reflection spectra, and there's like 20 different classes of asteroids based on reflection spectra that, that sort of correspond to, to the mineralogy. And we can match those to the reflection spectra we see of asteroids in heliocentric orbit. And so because reflection spectra match, for about 60% of asteroids we have spectra for, we have a match. And that means that those asteroids, the surface must be almost homogeneously covered in the same material as we have from those meteorites. And if the surface is homogeneously covered, no one really has a good model where it wouldn't be that the whole thing is homogeneously that same material. So that means that we've got a pretty high confidence that we know the mineralogy of 60% of the asteroids, which is much better than we can say for the moon, which is the size of, of you know, surface area of Africa. And we have, is it six or 10 grab samples from the uh, Apollo and, and uh, Luna uh, um, Russian missions? So. We do actually know more about the mineralogy of the asteroids than we do of the moon. Uh, the second thing is the, um, the working environment. Uh, the asteroids, you know, they tend to be spinning. They tend to be hovering around the equilibrium temperature for things at that distance from the sun, which is, you know, 10 to 13 degrees Celsius. The lunar south pole is 40 degrees Kelvin. That's a temperature which most metals act like glass. We don't know how to dig crushed material. We, we don't know how to operate at those kind of temperatures. Um, We've got a whole bunch of technology risk that goes along with that. We don't know the geological context of the water, and we don't know if we can actually put a shovel in or we just shatter all of our shovels. Um, so that's a challenge. Um, what the moon has as an advantage is that it's there in the sky, and everyone loves it, and it's a capital magnet. People will throw money at it, and that's what you're seeing with Artemis. It's, uh, you, know, you see that with a bunch of other things. But um, the flip side of that is it's also a religious symbol. And if you start announcing that you're going to strip mine the moon, there's going to be a lot of people that don't want you to do that. Uh, whereas the asteroids, they're the cockroaches of the solar system. Right? There's, there's millions of them, and no one cares if you squash a few. So uh, so that's another reason that, that, that I'm for the asteroid. Um, with the asteroids, you can't build up infrastructure, though, on the surface. The moon, that's, that's possibly the biggest advantage. Is you can build up infrastructure over time. Everything you invest gets to stay there, and you can build a continuous mining operation. The asteroids are going around the sun relative to the Earth, so you need to run short period mining campaigns, which is the kind of thing they do in Alaska and what have you, where you go in for a summer, get out what you can, and then just move all your equipment further south and wait for the next summer. Um, so that's kind of how asteroid mining will look, is short period mining campaigns, at, le at least initially. Um, so either way, I'm, I'm still more bullish on asteroids, but it doesn't need me to be right. Uh, it just needs somebody to make money. And so I'm quite happy supporting lunar mining too. Is it easier to get to the moon or the asteroids? It seems like the asteroids are really far away. Ah, so define easier. Most um, aerospace engineers and rocket scientists will define easy in terms of delta V, which is to say the amount of speed change or the amount of fuel that you need. So because the moon has no atmosphere, you have to land on a rocket. You have to, to get rid of all your speed by burning a rocket to effectively get down and hover your way to the moon. Um, that takes a lot of rocket fuel with an asteroid. It's, it's in effectively zero gravity, right? You, you, you dock to an asteroid, you don't land on an asteroid. So that takes so much less fuel. So there's actually, um, gosh, I don't know what the numbers are now. They're probably like 3,000 um, near Earth asteroids that take less rocket fuel to get to and get back from than, uh, than it takes to get to the surface of the moon and back. Um, and that's an advantage when what you're trying to do is, is bring back heavy things. You, can bring back more for the same amount of fuel that you initially sent up. Um, you can take more equipment with you, all, all that kind of thing. So in terms of delta V, in terms of fuel requirements, the asteroids are closer. Um, in terms of time, which is also a commodity, the moon is fairly close in terms of time. To, to get to an asteroid, 
Uh, anyway, our, our baseline uh, mining plan at Deep Space Industries was six months drifting out or, or powering our way out to an asteroid. We'd spend uh, six months or so at the asteroid and then six months powering our way back for an 18 month uh, mining cycle. Um, when you go to the moon, firstly, yeah, you're building up the, uh, the equipment there so you can have a continuous mining process and getting there and getting back is, is only a matter of days. Uh, and so in that respect, the moon is closer, but it really depends how you're looking at it. And there's so many other factors. That's mining is, mining is complicated. Every single mine is different. Every single mine is a, is a research and development program on the ground on earth, let alone when you go to space. What do you think about the opportunity for investment in uh, space resources from the mining industry? Th those, those guys invest billions of dollars into uh, extracting resources from a mine in the ground. And that's commensurate with the costs that we're talking about for building an asteroid mining pro project. Yeah, it is. The, um, when, you, when you look at the, the mining process and, and how, how mining happens terrestrially, and this is the, the advantage of, of my first startup company, which we, we built a machine to uh, to do geochemical assay. We could tell how much metal was in the rocks, um, and uh, and so I got to know these mining companies as prospective customers and understand what drove their business models, their valuations, and, and the things that they cared about. Um, they will spend money going through successive cycles of um, do some more exploration, exploration, learn more about the rocks, and reduce the geological risk. So you're more and more certain that the metal you want is actually there in quantity and you can extract and everything. And you'll do a, a bunch of analysis on the business plan and, and the mining plan, the development plan, and then raise some money and go and you know, pick up rocks or do some more geophysics or drill a hole or step your holes out in a line to find out where the edge of the ore body is or drill a grid to find out what it looks like, consistency. And there's all these steps. They'll spend $100 million before they decide not to build a mine. Uh, because a mine costs a billion dollars. Now, when we look at how you'll prospect an asteroid, it's probably going to take a lot more to do that prospecting than a hundred million dollars, but maybe not. Uh, and we, we're driving down the cost all the time. But you know, should we follow a similar process? How do we get enough confidence in geology and in our extraction techniques? So the second risk area after geology risk is technology risk. And I, I think um, a great analogy is the Olympic Dam mine in Australia. It's one of the world's biggest underground mines. Uh, it's the world's biggest uranium deposit. It's the world's biggest rare earth element deposit, but it's set up as a copper mine where they extract gold, silver, and uranium credits. The rare earth elements they throw in the tailings pond because the metallurgy doesn't work. To, if they optimize for these other things, they, they end up making the, the rare earth elements into a, an oxide state that's hard to extract. And so they just dump them. So it's a polymetallic ore body. They went through, I think it was seven different... Um, metallurgical process uh, maps and like flow sheets trying to figure out how to extract the most value from this given that the recovery rate's never 100% and different processes have different costs and eventually decided what they could make money on. They set it up as this copper mine with uranium gold silver credits. So that's, that's a terrestrial polymetallic mine. That's not trivial. There's lots of cycles. As you try and figure out the technology, you run trial mining campaigns, you set up pilot plants, you decide that didn't work so well, you throw all of that investment out and you start again. Uh, it took them decades, um, but the net result is they, they have really a, a fantastically productive mine now that they've got it right. So, um, yeah, we, technology risk, a, a huge, huge question. Can we can we dig it? Like, can we put a shovel in or is it just made of sand um, or is it made of basalt, um, you know, solid rock, granite, something like that? Like, what are these things actually made of is a, is a huge question. And then how will our technology interact with that? So the second risk is technology. Um, so that's, that's sort of the process that mining the mining industry goes through. And then you, know, you need your market. You, you need to have, have market risk in hand. How much are people paying for the material? That's why we're doing all of that, right? And get that market risk down because that's too high to set up a mine in space yet. But then you run into to the financing risk. <clears throat> and financing, which really sort of comes to the crux of your question, um, when you go to, to finance it, you have to put in that money up front and make that investment. You want some security. You want to guarantee that you're actually going to get a return and get paid. And there you're looking at what we call country risk, right? You're looking at, will, will some nation just appropriate your operation? Will somebody jump your plane? Can you go to a court of law um, in, a, in a competent jurisdiction and they'll, they'll sue the other guys and force them to stop uh, if they're taking advantage of the fact that you've just spent $100 million and proved it's nice and now they've gone in without having to spend that and build a mine in, in that nice area that you thought was yours. 
Um, so there's there's no ownership, um, but there might be secure tenure. This is country political risk. We don't know the tax rates, right? If you jack the tax rate up by 20, 30, 40, 100%, um, that'll destroy your business model. So how do you build a business model to then get the financing on? And without secure tenure, without being able to say that, those minerals in the ground are my exclusive, like I have exclusive rights to those. So if I invest the money and reduce the risk and I'm able to eventually build a mine, I will have exclusive rights to those minerals. And that underlies all mine financing. It's that secure tenure asset. And that does not exist in space. So you cannot go to traditional mining companies and say, please invest in mine exploration here. Because they'll turn around and say, show me your mining claim. Show me your mining lease. What rights do you have? Uh, where was this filed, right? And the answer is nothing. No, we got nothing. We can't. And that's that means that the space is going to be the preserve of national governments and billionaires who can take the risk. And uh, and any one of us who might be able to access capital markets and, and uh uh, and what have you, we're, we're out in the cold, we're screwed. So you know, anyone who believes that we want to democratize access to, to space minerals really needs to be pushing their government to put in place some proper secure tenure rights uh, and mineral rights uh, in space for, for asteroid and moon mining. That's lacking. And and that's a whole other discussion about space policy, which we, we've had at other events here at New Space Chicago. It's certainly a very, very fascinating and, and important area to, to talk about. Yeah, a decade ago, I, I told, um, I think it was Bob Richards from Moon Express, like, if you could get me secure tenure to to uh, an area on the moon, I can raise you $10, $20 million. But if you have secure tenure, you've got nothing. If you, if you don't have secure you tenure. And that, yeah. was, that was the top of the last mining boom in, in 2008, 2009, um, you know, before the economy crashed. Uh, and really, yeah, we, we could have raised $10, $20 million, but you had to have that secure tenure. Yeah. Uh, here's another question. Uh, throughout your career, how were you able to find STEM professionals to comprehensively evaluate technical feasibility of business plans, specific organizations or professional groups, other other places? <laughs> well, I don't trust anybody to do that because uh, when I started out in the industry, um, what constituted the typical um, space industry business plan was basically a statement of give me a billion dollars and I will save the world. Um, and that's not a business plan. Um, the industry has come a long way. Uh, investors now understand things a lot better. The entrepreneurs have much higher quality business plans and they understand the, you know, customer focus and uh, a minimum viable product and all these kind of things. So the industry is hugely advanced from where, you know, what I was looking at 20, 25 years ago. Um, <clears throat> but back then the, the answer was, I, I couldn't trust anybody. I had to figure it all out myself. That's why I got the engineering degree and went off to, to to build satellites because I had to learn that stuff. I had to be able to judge for myself whether it was a good, you know, what was driving the cost? Why is why do space missions cost so much? Uh, and the, lots of people have lots of different opinions, but until you've lived it, can you really sift through all of that? Uh, and so that's why you know, now I've, I've run a bunch of businesses. Each one of them has been an incredible learning experience. And I can tell you an enormous list of things that you should never do because I did all of them. Um, it's an absolute, uh, <laughs> Absolutely amazing learning experience, and uh, and it's a pretty tough road. But at the end of the day, um, when it comes to assessing the quality of things, um, there's a what, what do the economists call it? Um, a principal agent problem. Um, there, there's always people with with different incentives. There are people that think they know more than they do in, a, in an area in which almost nobody knows anything. Um, you've got to be able to make your own judgment calls. That was my conclusion, and I stick by that. So it is really damn hard to find people who know enough to be able to talk um, uh, intelligently about these. Uh, and then you're, you're also struck with the problem that um, the, the, to, to figure these out, we just have to go out and make mistakes. And someone in the middle of trying something is absolutely certain, I'm absolutely certain Orbit Fab is correct, right? Everything we're doing is right. And the only way that I can learn is by making a mistake and finding out that we were wrong. Um, so should you trust me? Well. Not entirely. I think we're a good bet, but you should realize that um, you know, insert the uh, the investors' caveats here, right? Um, your investment may result in nothing. Um, that's the trick. You've got to make your own assessment. Uh, I don't know how better to answer that. No, I think I think that's pretty right on. Uh, this is such a new area that we are all learning as we go along, 
and yeah. we absolutely have to learn learn for ourselves how to evaluate these things. Uh, here's another one. What kind of legal or policy barriers are there for the commodities market in orbit? Whew, um, That's a big one. Gosh. <laughs> so <laughs> let's see. The governing law is the Outer Space Treaty, which says that each country is responsible for um, the actions of its citizens and, and companies and what have you. Um, so if, uh, if I launch a tank of fuel and you've got a satellite and I pump the fuel from my satellite into your satellite, does that mean I'm now responsible for your satellite? Uh, or that, that my country is severally and wholly liable. So if anything goes wrong, you can sue the countries that I represent. Um, there's a whole bunch of, of weird unknowns that are going to need to get ironed out in terms of how we do things and how we attribute liability and all the rest. Um, so that's a, that's a, challenging one um yeah d d the jurisdiction and especially when you look at asteroid mining and that whole you know who has jurisdiction who has has ownership over what we get to establish uh, a lot of those norms um let alone as as regulation as legislation and regulations so there's a lot of work to be done on that um yeah at the end of the day we're just going to have to build it and establish our own norms that's that's often the case um and then as people let it ride and let it stick for longer and longer, it becomes common law under under international common law. Uh, it uh, it becomes something you can uphold in the court. Um, if we're talking about commodities markets, do you see that uh, there are actually new policies that need to be developed there, or, or are there existing uh, ways of doing business that can apply? Um, yeah, I mean, one of the things to to that I've seen in this industry is a lot of people have hubris that, um, that the space industry people are smarter than everybody else. Um, we're not. Um, <laughs> we need to adopt a lot of things. So if you can find commodities exchanges that have solved this problem, just adopt what they're doing. <laughs> just, just bring them along for the ride to space. Same goes for every single industry. So in that respect, the commodities exchange is the commodities exchange. The commodities exchange, it's, you know, there's some devil in the details. We've got to figure out what it means to have a delivery terminal or location when nothing is nothing is stationary, <laughs> it's traveling at, at uh, you know, seven and a half kilometers per second in low Earth orbit. So, so what does that mean? Um, so there's a bunch of definitions we just have to get right. But uh, but fundamentally, um, there's nothing new to this in the way transactions happen. Right. Uh, here's another one. You mentioned that uh, satellite coalitions were imminent. So is there a plan once satellite satellites are self-sufficient with your fuel system to remove these possibly dangerous satellites efficiently. Yeah, oh, absolutely. I'm sorry. I said, uh, I should have said satellite collisions were imminent. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah so uh, there is, and, and you know, there's a bunch of statistical analysis being done on the probabilities of collisions and, and you know, different orbits, different risk profiles and things like that. Looking at, uh, at the risks, there's a lot of money being spent on space situational awareness, which means to say, trying to find the smaller and smaller bits of debris because even very small bits traveling at, uh, at you know, kilometers per second have a huge amount of energy and can cause cause these these cascades, these secondary explosions and, and uh, secondary debris events. So the monitoring is improving. Um, and there are commercial companies that will, will uh, provide these services because um, companies have to get out of the way, right? You don't, you don't want to be in the way and cause... Uh, a, um, a collision, uh, have a collision happen in the middle of your operational constellation. So there's a benefit for the companies to know when to get out of the way. <clears throat> but the uh, the debris removal then, the, the active debris removal, getting rid of the, some of those big pieces, um, there are some demonstration missions currently ongoing. The, the, uh, the Japanese company Astroscale has a, uh, a debris removal demonstration currently in orbit. Um, the European Clear Space mission launches in a, in a couple of years. Uh, it will, rather than doing a demonstration by bringing along something that simulates debris, it will actually go after a piece of debris and remove a piece of debris from orbit. And that'll be a first. That's a, that's a huge thing to be happening. Um, so that's a, a Swiss, European Space Agency Swiss uh, mission. I think there's an Italian mission also planned. The Chinese, I believe, have something actually in orbit right now um, that they're doing a, a mission to test these things. So there's lots of tests going on. The problem is the business model. The problem is that Basically, it's a tragedy of the commons. No one owns orbit, and therefore, it's in nobody's economic interest to keep it clean. 
Uh, and so, you know, let's just let's just throw the plastic in the ocean. Right? Let's just throw the satellites into space. It's not my problem anymore. It doesn't help my business plan to spend money to get rid of them. Uh, the answer to this is probably regulations. Um, it's either regulations or privatization. Either we privatize orbit, and that's not going to happen because the UN will show up a stink, uh, or we bring in regulations and have to regulate it, in which case you can't get a launch license or an operator's license or, or anything like that uh, unless... Your, and currently it's unless you're removing your debris, but in the future maybe it'll be uh, unless you take out an insurance policy such that if your spacecraft fails, uh, somebody will come along and remove you from orbit, one of these garbage collection uh, tow trucks. Uh, and then that, that's the trick, is how is that business model closed uh, when that gets introduced? The regulators won't introduce that until there is an operational capability to be able to provide the service. Um, but with all these demos being done, we expect that there will be an operational capability in uh, you know, in a few years' time that will be commercially available. My hope is that the regulators will then act and, uh, and make it a requirement that everybody has insurance. And here's a related question. Uh, what do you do with tankers that run out of propellant? Do you deorbit them or try to keep the tanker in orbit to refuel yourself or hope that eventual asteroid fuel will come? Yeah, good. And, and whoever asked that question is uh, insightful enough to, to realize that um, until we have fuel coming down the gravity well from asteroids, every time that we launch a tank, we've launched a tank and we don't need to refill one that's there because we've just launched a new one. Um, so in the early years, those tanks are disposable. We will have insurance policies with um, uh, deorbit you know, um, trash garbage collection satellite deorbiting service vehicles uh, companies. So we'll be able to get that uh, out of orbit. Like they all have small thrusters, so they should be able to get themselves out of orbit. But in case they fail, we have an insurance policy. So we're doing a, a lot to make sure that they definitely get out of orbit. Um, I would love to sell them to a recycling company, someone that wants to repurpose them in orbit, uh, you know, a junkyard in space. And I've seen a couple of business models like that, but no one's been ready yet to say that they would take over ownership of our derelict tankers once they're empty. So uh, baseline plan, clear them out of orbit, make sure that orbit is clear, keep launching new tankers. Uh, but absolutely, as soon as there's material ready or, or we start preempting that there's material ready to come down the gravity well from asteroids on the moon, yeah, we'll be, we'll be collecting tankers so that we can fill them up again. Um, that's absolutely part of the plan. Okay, great. Um, let's see here. Um, okay. Well, there's, okay, there's a number of questions here about uh, orbital debris. There's another one about a business model to remove or deorbit existing space debris. Um, this doesn't, I'm not sure I'm following this. They, they, are, they are present before any regulations or insurance policy. I think this is uh, referring back to what you were just talking about a moment ago, about the, the business model for removing or deorbiting. Yeah, very difficult until there's regulations requiring it. Yeah. Um, so, okay, based on your experience, do you see any potential for gathering up space debris, applying some metallurgical scrap processes in orbit, and then using them rather than deorbiting them? So, in other words, salvage. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and there's some companies talking about that. I think, is it um, Cislunar or Spaceforge? Um, have uh, have some of these ideas um so no one's managed i think to close the business case yet people are trying um one thing that they need is the fuel to be able to to run a uh, a tow truck to go and collect <laughs> the bits of debris and bring them into a to a facility where they can get processed uh the other thing they need is the um technology for processing that and turning it into something people want to buy and the third thing they need a market where people want to buy reprocessed materials in space um I'd argue that none of those three things exist yet. And and that market sort of depends on having a manufacturing capability as well. Yeah, and that, that goes to you know, what are your customers trying to buy? Um, one of the more interesting things that I've seen is, uh, is can you process um, the metals into a, uh, a solid um, electric propellant uh, using something like a false plasma thruster? Um, that's interesting ideas. Um, but pulse plasma thrusters are not used widely because they're not great thrusters. So you've got to ask yourself, why is that? How does that become feasible? Uh, so I'm not yet convinced on those, but again, I, I think I mentioned before, it doesn't need me to be right. It just needs someone to figure out how to make money off it. 
And one of, one of the issues is uh, we have these graveyard orbits where there are satellites that have been that are out of commission that were boosted up and they're just sitting there. There there are resources filled with highly refined aerospace grade aluminum and electronics and so on and so forth. And it seems like there ought to be an opportunity to to recycle all of that material. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Looking forward to someone doing it. <laughs> Okay, here's a slightly different question. Um, how do you handle handle intele international intellectual property? Oh, the same way every other industry does, by <laughs> handing over a large amount of cash to some lawyers. Now, is there any other way to do it? <laughs> I, I think that's it. Um, what are the most exciting engine slash fuel developments that you've seen proposed or currently being worked on? I.e., what's the state of innovation in propulsion? Oh, that could be um, a whole separate presentation. So I really like what's happening with hydrogen peroxide, uh, benchmark space systems, and, uh, and I think there's a, a few others. Um, partly because we can make hydrogen peroxide out of water. Um, storable oxidizers are hard. Um, the best storable oxidizers that we use at the moment, are nitrous tetroxide, contains nitrogen, which doesn't exist on the moon or asteroids, uh, whereas we can get water from both those locations. Uh, and therefore, hydrogen peroxide is, is quite viable. Uh, Orbit Fab is just options and technology from Rice University for making hydrogen peroxide out of water using a uh, electrochemical um, uh, proton exchange membrane, basically a fuel cell that's been tweaked to produce peroxide uh, as its output. So, um, so we were already starting to look at this as, as part of our intention of becoming a, uh, you know, a, a petrochemicals type company in space, doing that doing that uh, production. Um, so yeah, we like the thruster work that's being done in that area. Um, I like all the water-based thrusters. Um, I know that the Momentus thruster had a lot of promise. I really like the idea of an RF pump uh, plasma thruster, water plasma thruster. Uh, however, that produces atomic oxygen, which is notorious for, for eating its way through any thruster. Uh, and I don't know that they've solved that problem. Um, I look forward to one day seeing a working RF plasma thruster. Um, yeah, so that, that there's a there's a whole bunch of, of super interesting things that uh, that can be worked on, but the biggest um, I've heard it described as the the uh, the most important aspect, the most um, valuable aspect of a thruster, um, the most valuable ability is availability. Uh, at the moment, there's a lot of vaporware, there's a lot of PowerPoint thrusters, there's a lot of development programs, there's very few commercial products, very few things uh, that you can actually buy. Uh, and even less that you can buy on a reasonable time scale. Um, thrusters can take a long time to manufacture. So that's a problem. And uh, you know, solving it, everybody comes in saying, oh, well, I'll just, I'll just make them. It turns out that getting the money to make them and finding the customers that justify making the production lines and everything else is still hard. Uh, and so, yeah, that, that's some of the challenges. I think we have time for just one or two more questions here. Um, here's one more. How do you refuel a spinning spacecraft? And I, I'll, I'll just uh, elaborate on that. There's two different use cases. One is a spacecraft which is intentionally spinning for stability, and another one which is uh, tumbling out of control. Two different use cases. Yeah, our, our answer is we don't. Um, our answer is we work with the satellite servicing companies, and they can go and deal with difficult satellites. But our architecture is that we will only do purely cooperative dockings where both sides want to be docked with, are ready to be docked with, are carrying the right equipment to be docked, uh, that are sending out the right signal, saying they're happy, that are notifying the world of exactly what they're doing so no one is surprised and no one thinks that there's going to be any third party damage and clouds of debris, like everything is really well known. Then we think a docking is safe. But everything else we call a tow truck. Okay. Um, and I guess this is our last question then. Um, you kind of touched on this earlier, but specifically, um, what are the on-orbit services that OrbitFab is offering that would be important for debris mitigation? Fuel. <laughs> we offer the fuel. Uh, if, if you're trying to remove debris from orbit, you have to go and grab a bit of debris and then take it somewhere safe and then go get the next piece of debris and then take it somewhere safe and then go get the next bit of debris and then take it somewhere safe. All of these maneuvers take fuel, right? All of these take sometimes quite a lot of fuel, depending on how big the piece of debris is or how far you have to move it. And so the biggest problem has been that if you launch a tow truck that can do these, right? If you launch a satellite that servicing vehicle that can, can do all these towing things around, 
you inherently can't put enough fuel in it to do more than a very small number of debris removal activities. We sell a fuel, now fuel is an operational expense, right? Just come and get fuel every time and it's cheaper that way because you're not towing your fuel around and, you, and your fuel tank was smaller and your fuel tank is smaller, your uh, actuators for maintaining um, position and attitude are smaller, everything gets a bit smaller. And, and so you can save a lot of money by having a smaller fuel tank and, and by getting fueled up uh, you know, every, every day, week, month, year, whatever it, it works out to, to be the best. Um, that means that you don't have to pay it upfront in capex. Um, you can only you, you can only pay for fuel when you've got a customer that's ready to pay for the uh, the deorbit service. And so that's a that's a huge change. In fact, it's the biggest driving cost of deorbit uh, services is the cost of replacing the asset when you run out of fuel. We fundamentally change that paradigm. That's what we do. Excellent. Well, Dan, this has been a, just a, an awesome conversation. I really appreciate you uh, taking time today to, to come and speak to the New Space Chicago. So thank you very much. Thanks, David. Real pleasure to be here. Great meeting a few of you uh, before. Um, I can hang around for a few more minutes if, uh, if we're going back to the room. What's the plan, David? Um, I have just a couple of comments here, and then um, we'll go back to the, back to the floor um, for the remainder of our time. And I think, well, let's see if this is going to be the right one. Nope, that's not the right one. There we go. Okay. Sorry, Dave, we can't hear you. Can, I heard you from there we are. Can you hear me now? Good, okay. Um, so I'll just say um, some of our upcoming events here next month, um, uh, we will have uh, a discussion about manufacturing in space presented by Robert Hoyt, who is the CEO of Tethers Unlimited. And that will be the last event for our spring uh, speaker event series. We'll take a break over the summer, and then we will return in the fall with uh, a new series of uh, events. Um, it's unclear whether that will still be virtual or in person. Uh, that is TBD. Um, and then in October, uh, New Space Chicago will once again be the local lead for this year's iteration of the NASA Space Apps competition. Um, Dan, can you maybe mute yourself? I'm getting feedback. Yeah, there we go. Uh, so we look forward to once again being the local lead for uh, this year's iteration of the NASA Space Apps competition. Um, and then I'll just remind you that uh, New Space Chicago is a registered Illinois 501c3 organization. Uh, we do operate on uh, uh, sponsorships and uh, donations. Your tax deductible donation helps support the entrepreneurial space industry in Chicago. If you want to become a sponsor of New Space Chicago, we have two different uh, sponsor levels. Uh, one is the event sponsor, um, and that would uh, give you uh, visibility for one event. Uh, you would have um, signage and, and uh, your company logo and so forth in the uh, virtual environment. And uh, premier sponsors um, uh, support the organization for an entire year, and uh, your uh, uh, company name, signage, logo, and so forth would be uh, visible and promoted throughout the entire year. So uh, once again, uh, thank you for coming to New Space Chicago, and uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, next time. So uh, now I will return us to the floor.